21st Century Entrepreneurship with Martin Piskarik. Oh, Brian, what does it mean top 10 smartest solution for government? Oh, man. And you are you in, in development council as well. Kansas City. A lot of things yeah, going so on I, in Kansas with you. Yeah, there's uh, uh, Kansas City is an amazing market. Uh, we're 28th, the 28th largest uh, market in the United States, which is which is something that uh, people don't realize, but it's a, a, a big little city. Uh, literally smack dab in the middle of the United States. And in fact, uh, Meta, uh, you know, formerly known as Facebook, but Meta just announced a, a billion dollar uh, investment in Kansas City, uh, parking a, a new state-of-the-art data center here. But no, Kansas City, Kansas City is an amazing place. It's, it, it's kind of funny when you think of the United States uh, and you think of how the West was won and, and uh, really how... Um, this country evolved and, and moved west when the railroads were being built um, the easiest thing they could do is to lay down telephone lines uh, right next to all of the railroads right yes it, it, it's cost of uh, infrastructure keeping it low and so um, that then paved the way for you know data lines being laid down kind of in a similar fashion so when you look at uh, Kansas City what people don't realize there's massive um, data pipes that literally, literally run underneath the city. We've got caves all over this uh, this place, um, and there's big data centers all over, and and uh, it's a huge home for technologies. So we have companies like uh, Garmin, uh, like Cerner, um, AT and T, uh, uh, Sprint is a huge uh, employer here now. T Mobile. And then, of course, you've got uh, great creatives um, like Hallmark. You know, Hallmark mm -hmm. Cards was founded here. And we have more artists per capita than, than San Francisco here in Kansas City. So when you think about places to build uh, next generation technology, it's not about like just having a bunch of software developers available to you. It's really the the tapestry of experience that you get to um, interact with on a daily basis and sort of the variety of use cases and industries and, and types of people, that diversity of, of, uh, of experience and skill set and, and even the way of thinking is what makes great technology, you know. Um, and so this is a really interesting market. I'm really proud to be here. I'm not originally from Kansas City, um, but I've spent most of my adult life here. And so I'm a huge fan of it. Um, and I think it's a special place. Is it uh, because of uh, old companies such as AT and T or tax policy or? Yeah, you know uh, Crosby Kemper, um, like kind of one of the the founders or, or I guess contemporaries uh, in Kansas. You know the the when you think about um, the Midwest, so the Midwestern part of the United States, it's very agricultural. Mm -hmm. So what you have here. Uh, is sort of this nexus of uh, intermodal transportation. So you've got rail, you've got trucking, you got air, and you got mm -hmm. like, for example, customs. Customs out of Mexico is cleared here in Kansas City. And so when you when you start thinking then about all these businesses that sort of proliferate from there, and, and telecom being one of them, um, you know, these healthcare uh, uh, healthcare is a huge thing because of animal science, right? So there's a huge uh, life sciences, animal sciences, uh, uh, focus, the Stowers Institute, the leading uh, cancer institute in the world is based here. Uh, and so you start thinking about how all that happened. Well, it, it happened because you had these amazing entrepreneurs um, that took advantage of some industry, um, you know, tailwinds, and, and it sort of proliferated in a really steady way. But what gets really fascinating about Kansas City in particular is it's surrounded by agriculture. So what you end up with is almost this insulation, this, this buffering layer um, that meant that, for example, uh, when Sprint uh, over the last decade or so, you know, they've had some layoffs as that business sort of grew and Sprint Nextel, if you remember that, and Sprint PCS, and, uh, you know, they've been groundbreaking in the mobile industry for a long time, but they've also had some corrections. And when they're laying off, you know, thousands of people, this place doesn't miss a beat. Like you don't even, you don't even feel it because 
the market and the economy is so insulated, it's so diverse, and you've got this buffer of agriculture business, which is you know it's nice and steady, and, and you know it's just a, uh, a, a kind of part of Middle America. And so I think the reason you have so much uh, innovation here. It's the combination of an of an economy that is really insulated from highs and lows in a healthy way. Two, uh, people here are very pragmatic. You know, they don't get all excited about the next great thing. Um, you have to prove something works. There's not a lot of early adopters who get all excited about the singularity event and all this other stuff, which is also intellectually stimulating for sure. But this market just doesn't, that's not what gets people excited, right? Um, these are tough, pessimist uh, people that, that are real practical. It's like, it's got to work. Uh, and then there's kind of a lack of venture, high-risk capital. There's a ton of capital here, a lot of wealth in this particular part of the country. Um, but even the wealth is, uh, is risk-averse in some ways. And so what you end up with is this amazing sort of Petri dish where the best ideas come and they get forced to uh, perform. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's not a lot of room for, uh, you know, people to kind of, you know, burn cash as they're trying to find product market fit or whatever. There's practical people that say, Hey, that's a great technology. I can apply it to this problem in this industry. They can do it like that, like instantly. And so there's, it's just a market where I think it's that, that pragmatic nature of the people that are here apply. That's kind of the key word is this is a, this is a market of applied ingenuity, applied innovation, uh, not just innovation uh, for innovation's sake. Why is it important to be in development council for you? Ah, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, like I said, I grew up, um, I, I was born in Germany. Um, I've, grow, I've spent time all over the country. I travel, uh, I mean, I, I travel some far flung place once a week, at least, if not more. Um, and so I think for me, I have a pretty good perspective on this. Um, but when you think about uh, building a business, so I'm an entrepreneur, I've got multiple companies, uh, I'm the CEO of, I think, one of the, you know, potentially most valuable data and AI businesses in the world. Um, and I, I think about how do we succeed? And I, I get the pleasure of taking people that are highly skilled, best in the world, um, having exposed them to you know really really difficult environments and situations and use cases and then having a market like kansas city the way it is with its features again that that sort of practical pragmatic approach to everything we do here in the midwest and in particular the kansas city region and i think of that as this great like recipe for success you take uh that that technical skill the fire in the belly gumption to go solve a problem and be innovative and then an environment that sort of forces people, um, you know, to prove it. And I think that is a unique thing in the world, uh, especially in high tech. So I would go out and my experience was, I, I would go out to Seattle. I've sold Microsoft customer. I've been to New York talking to the biggest, like JP Morgan and all these, uh, you know, you, you go and have these experiences when you talk to the world's most important companies um, you've got government sized problems, uh, you know, where we spend a lot of time, uh, today and you realize that actually, um, that sort of combination of people, skill environment that creates this innovation that solves a real problem for people, um, it's really unique. And so I've learned that. And, and I used to think of, of this, uh, you know, maybe not as a, a strong, uh, bullet point in our marketing campaigns, right? The fact that we were from Kansas City. But what I learned was it was actually a huge weapon. I used to try and cover up the fact that I wasn't from, uh, you know, San Francisco, mm -hmm. didn't go to Stanford, you know, uh, didn't go to MIT. Uh, the company wasn't founded in Boston. I used to hide the fact that it wasn't that. Um, and it wasn't until later that I actually fully appreciated, um, you know, the, the, the power of what we had because we were beating those people. We were beating the West Coast firms. We were beating the Boston-based firms. 
um, because we had these, uh, these features of the business. And so I started celebrating that. And then I got inspired to move beyond me, right? I think that's a part of life. Um, kind of the punchline here is that I think, you know, in life, you, you go on these journeys um, and at some point you realize, uh, or you have this opportunity maybe to make it not about you, but about others. And so I, about 10 years ago, kind of shifted my point of view in life. Um, and I think one of the things as a, as an entrepreneur, you know, you have this, um, uh, sort of innate desire to help other people. And so that's kind of what it's about. I was asked to, uh, join the board of the cancer development council and had been an investor in the council for a long time. Um, and I have a, real passion around trying to bring uh, high tech companies to Kansas City and also to help grow, um, you know, grow uh, innovative startups uh, from within too. So I think that's, that's kind of, you know, in a nutshell, uh, you know, why it's important to me and why it's, you know, why it's, you know, a, a kind of a personal passion of mine. Any other uh, personal development transformations during your uh, un- business journey? Oh man, uh, we probably are going to run out of time before I would go through them all. I mean, I, I've gone, I've done a lot of things in my life. And, um, you know, I think one of the things I've enjoyed, uh, that's sort of a metaphor for everything I've done, is, is Iron Man. Um, I was, uh, I, I started racing Ironman, um, kind of a crazy thing. My father had a brain tumor and there's a story there, but, um, one of the reasons, one of the ways I dealt with that was, was the idea that he and I would race together someday after he had this massive surgery, which he almost died from, but, but fortunately survived. Unfortunately, we never really did race together. It was a very brief moment, uh, when we did. And, and there's a whole other, uh, story around that. But, uh, but probably the best thing uh, is sort of how you think of life as a, as a series of sprints in a long race. And how you um, adopt, you know, choose to have discipline around these things. So I've, I've been a top ranked Ironman athlete. And I've also had injury and setback and all those things. And, and what matters is, do you have the, the discipline and resilience? And I, so I think, you know, there's things like that in life. And uh, I've certainly lived through a lot of that stuff. But, uh, but in the end, um, I think it, it, what I've learned and what I try and adopt, I'm not always great at it. And I have my weak moments. Um, but if I can institute a good habit, a daily habit, the rest of it sort of falls in line. And so that's kind of maybe one of the learnings, right? So whether it's, you know, athletic performance, whether it's running a business, whether it's coming up with some idea for a startup or, or anything else, um, I think it all begins uh, with just having good habits that you execute on a daily basis. I think that's, that's probably, that's probably the key for sure. I saw some amazing stuff on your website. The world's hardest problems, the world's greatest minds, key national security issues, total bad asses. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I you know, it's kind of funny because uh, we have the, the, these crazy good people and they're just, they are total badasses. They are. Every single person here, I mean, when you come to work here, uh, we we sort of have we've created an environment where I can take someone with uh, some pretty good skills, but certainly they don't have to come in with like these amazing uh, this amazing experience in artificial intelligence or or you know math or whatever. And in a relatively short amount of time. It, when you take someone that has the raw talent and the desire and you put them in an environment where uh, there's a high expectation of, for performance, um, there's autonomy, there's trust, uh, and you put them in an environment where they're doing something important, uh, something that has purpose, they'll turn into a badass like right in front of your eyes. And so that's been really rewarding and fun. And that's kind of part of that. But but I think, you know, um, 
as we think about uh, technology, and you know, we're a business that is on the forefront of artificial intelligence at, at, at scale today. Really, there's been this this degradation of humanity. People are um, as the data has proliferated and grown and volume and complexity, um, that so have the jobs. So a human being today typically has to interact with documents and systems and data sources and buckets and storage backups and all this other stuff, right? And that degradation of humanity has come in that form where the technology it isn't supporting people anymore. Uh, it used to, right? Back even in the 80s when uh, you know, data warehousing was kind of a hot thing. Um, we talked about how, wow, an application could help a human be more productive. Well, now we've reached the point because the architectures have not changed. Fundamentally, the data centric, data warehouse centric architecture hadn't changed. And so what's, what's come out the other end of that um, is kind of what we say is this degradation of humanity where people are working for technology. It isn't, they're not, Technology doesn't work for us anymore in that way. Certainly, technology helps you on your personal life and a mobile phone. Uh, but when you when you get into the average enterprise, especially large enter commercial enterprises, which is where we're focused, um, and you start asking people about, you know, hey, I have a two thousand person company. Well, break down the that your workforce. You know, what it's, what's everybody doing? How many people are selling? How many people are doing this? How many people are doing that? You find out that like sixty to eighty percent of the people in an average company. Um, are messing around with messy data. And it's, the, you know, again, I think from our perspective, that's probably the big uh, place where there ought to be more and more attention. Um, people are working for information. They're working for these systems and it's not the other way around. I think that's probably, so, so as a company, that's where we decided to focus. Um, our, our big thing, no matter what the use case is, we just make information easier to use. That's that's what that's what we think the world needs more of for sure. You are speaking about environment, uh, autonomy, trust, purpose. How would you define environment as a context in your company, in your team, between your employees? So when you say environment. You need a good environment. What is a good environment for you? For all the entrepreneurs that are listening to you at the moment, yeah. maybe some. Yeah, great, great question. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to clarify. I think an environment is, it, it's the environment that a company creates. It's sort of a, a little bit culture, right? So um, culture is an aspect of it, but I think it starts with uh, what is your organizational structure? Like literally what's the reporting structure? Um, and then it's, you know, what's really required of those people from an operational perspective. You know? So excuse uh, me, the structure, uh, do you mean a uh, document flow and information flow or something else? Yeah, so I, I literally mean the hierarchy, like a, ah, a, a, okay. a command, command and control. Who's the mm -hmm. boss? Uh, why? How are these departments set up? So often what, what I found is that um, there's a management layer that's there to kind of effectuate some sort of task, but we really lose the potential of um, harnessing the intellect and ingenuity of the people. If you create a culture um, or an environment where the rule is, and I think that's kind of what your answer might be, it's what are the rules? If, there, if the rule is that you're supposed to look around and see problems, cross-functional problems, um, I think that creates uh, a little uh, some openness that from my experience has, has paid dividends because I have people that are willing to say, hey, you know what? I see a problem over here. I don't touch that every day, but could we try this over there? Um, and then I think the, the second thing would be, you know, when I say rule, it's like the rule might be to enable something, to enable communication, to enable openness. The second part is as a leader in the business, you have to decide, are you going to do it bottom up or top down? I'm more of a bottom up guy. Um, I, I get frustrated, in fact, when I have to make all the decisions. Sometimes that's my own fault, though, by the way. But it's as a leader, you're going to decide, do you need to be involved in everything 
or are you just involved in the parts that are important like to you? Can you build a system so that your people can go out and kind of do what they need to do? They, they are aligned with, with what the outcome is. So, so to me, the best type of environment are, 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 is one where there's, you know, generally positive sentiment. Uh, you're, you're openly talking about mistakes or setbacks, right? Because if you're not, um, you know, you're losing an opportunity to evolve as a team. I think that's a big thing. You're open to criticism, right? That's what an entrepreneur is. An entrepreneur has to be open to criticism because you're trying to improve. The whole point of being an entrepreneur is you're there to improve every day. So to me, that's kind of part of the expectation. That's a rule. The rule here is you better be trying to improve yourself and you better be open to criticism. But I think the other part is, um, as a leader, you're going to decide, um, how you're going to operate for me, the best, uh, piece of advice, the best learning that I've ever had is that, uh, let's just agree on what the outcomes are going to be. You and I might do things differently. We might have different tactics, radically different tactics, but if we could agree on what the outcome is, what the target outcome is, then we're good. And so what I find myself doing here, and I think what's unlocked a lot of success for me is before, you know, a, a conversation starts almost, you say, okay, let's, let's agree on what the outcome is. What are we trying to do? Okay. And then what do we imagine that the outcome to be, whether it's success or failure, let's imagine what it'll be so that we get aligned on how we're going to agree to measure the progress of this particular initiative. And if you do that, and you've got kind of these kind of rules of the road where you say, hey, I'm going to trust you. You're going to trust me. Um, we're going to be able to talk openly about each other and, and uh, uh, in a professional way. Um, and we got to be open to criticism. And you can agree on what an outcome is. I think that's a pretty good recipe for success. And people don't do that. I mean, believe it or not, like I find here where I get the most frustrated during the day. Because you know it's never perfect, right? You're always working at it. It's like when no one describes the outcome; everyone's just doing the task. They put their head down; they're not looking around. They're just like, "I just got to check this list, this thing on my checklist." Like, no, 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 stop. Well, let's look up for a minute. And go, what are we trying to do? And then, how will we know we're good? You know. And if you can stop everybody and think about it from that perspective, and then turn around and say, "Okay, now go back to the checklist. How does everything on that checklist ladder up to this?" great thing you're trying to do. I don't know. People don't do that. It's, it's, a, it's amazing. You can call that strategic planning, uh, you know, uh, the, pl the failure of strategic planning, which is also a pretty hot topic in organizational development. Um, and, uh, and, but I, I just kind of think of it as something simple, like, what are we trying to do? What's success look like? Do we agree? Yes or no? All right. Now, next question. So, I mean, regarding mistakes and, and outcome, the uh, perfection moment, uh, regarding responsibility and, and commitment, who owns the pain? Oh, the, the boss. <laughs> Still. Are you kidding me? Still. Well, of course, because, mm -hmm. well, it depends on what you're talking about. Now, I'm a founder, right? So I I started this company. Um, I, I invested in this company. Um, and so... Everything that's wrong with this company is a is a flaw of mine, right? And so that's just how I think. It's partly reality. Um, you know, when you're at the top, uh, you don't own any of the positives. You only own the negatives, right? So uh, I, I think, and this is how I sort of think in life, and it, it causes me all kinds of stress and premature gray hair and all that stuff. But the successes are your teams, and the failures are yours. Uh -huh. um, and that's just how I operate. Uh, and I get cranky. Um, I get cranky over, over, you know, why things aren't done a certain way and people aren't thinking, right. And, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, um, I mean, I think that's an absolute, uh, aspect of this, right. Um, so the, the, you know, who's to blame, who's, you know, who's responsible ultimately it's, it's you, even in a decentralized environment. Um, which again, I think is the, should be everyone's objective. I mean, there's a lot of leaders that have ego issues, right? So if you're immature, uh, you know, emotionally immature, you got, you know, really poor management expertise or experience, you're going to, you're going to be a command and control person and you're going to try and dictate every little thing. It'll break down on you at some point. You'll learn your lesson or you'll get fired or they'll, 
they'll mute me and they'll throw you out or they'll all quit. That's, that's what is in your future. If you're that kind of person, if you're, if you understand the concept of a decentralized org structure, you know, that that's the best answer period. And you know, that when they break down, it is often, uh, really only because there's not alignment on outcomes. If there's alignment on outcomes and stuff happens like, okay, you know, stuff happens. Like, you know, maybe we'll try something different, but at least we, we agreed on where we were headed. Um, but often I, what I find in a decentralized environment that's poorly managed, there's no agreement on what the, what success looks like. And so that means, you know, you have all of these, you know, examples of failure that the, the responsibility for that, even in a decentralized environment rests solely on the entrepreneur, the founder, the, the CEO, um, who was responsible for that architecture. You know, it's like, it's my job to make sure that everybody understands what the outcomes that we're driving to are. So, it, it, you know, any gap in that, you know, rests solely on one person's head and that's it, you know? Um, so I don't know. I, I hope that's the, 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 the clarifying kind of answer you expected, but I think that's, that's the burden, right? And if you're not cut out for it, then you're in the wrong seat. So yeah. coping okay. with the res responsibility. So you you are you are in sport. Uh, what kind of daily routine do you have? What's your mindset? How are you coping with uh, with with the responsibility? Yeah, uh, great great question. You know, it's uh, I, I've always been uh, more of a startup early stage kind of person, right? Uh, um, I have companies that are decades old. But I don't run them every day. Um, I own them, uh, and I, I know where I'm good. And I know where I'm bad. And so for me, that's very stressful, right? Because you're building, you're constantly building, you're putting fires out all the time, you're evolving, you're trying to help people. And and for me, uh, it's been really important. I think uh, exercise is a key thing. Um, I try and run every single day. My neighbors make fun of me because I at same time every day, same route. Uh, creature habit. And so I, I, like I said earlier, uh, I think you develop these habits, right? And so you can develop good habits or you can develop bad habits. I, I'm not, you know, I don't do drugs. I don't drink a lot. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't have those habits because those, I, I'm competitive. And I feel like uh, I'm the kind of person that uh, if you have those habits, I, I could kill you because I don't. <laughs> that's, that's, that's how I think in life. And so I think the more I can be disciplined around being healthy, even though I've had health issues and major surgery and all these other kind of things, I'm, I'm pretty fit because, and healthy. So when that stuff happens, you know, I've got a framework or a platform that I can, I can lean on that, that isn't, I'm not going to get derailed from it, you know? So I think one, having daily habits that are kind of critical is, is a key thing. So that to me is, is physical fitness um, and, and doing something to get your heart rate up every day. I think having a good relationship with a, a significant other, I think is absolutely a critical thing. A lot of people that want to be successful, they end up spending a, spending a lot of time and emotional energy on, uh, on, on, you know, chasing people around and kind of weak ego things. And I think that, that sometimes um, is also, uh, you know, one of these opportunities if, if you're out there, um, and I, I, I don't want this to sound sexist at all, but if you're out there as a CEO, and you're male and you're chasing women around and all this other stuff, I can kill you because I don't. And I think of that as a competitive uh, advantage that I have over somebody that is spending their brain power on that kind of activity. Um, and and I, I invest in, you know, heavily in having good relationships and things like that. So I think of my world as like hyper competitive in every aspect. But I get up. I get up uh, at, at five a.m. every day. I have three espressos. I work all morning. Uh, when when my daughter uh, gets up and, and goes out the door, I'm there for her every single morning. The minute she hits the door, I'm out running. Um, I run for an hour, come back, and, and I got, I got uh, twenty minutes to get ready, twenty minute uh, ride into work, and then I'm and then I've got my day, and I. I uh, I follow a program called time blocking in your calendar. And, and so I did this when I raced Ironman competitively and everything else, but you just basically, you have these immutable blocks of time in your calendar that you do not move no matter what. 
and then you leave a couple of stuff, you know, spots open and you let other people kind of fill in those. But I have, I manage my day and I manage my week very, very, um, in, in a very disciplined way using calendar blocking. Um, and that's how I do it. I don't eat lunch. Um, you know, occasionally I will, when I have a client meeting or something like that. Um, and, uh, I always do an afternoon, uh, espresso shot at two o'clock, uh, kind of give you that second boost, a little training tip. You, you learn when you're doing three workouts a day, uh, race an Ironman. But I think it's stuff like that, that, uh, if you can kind of develop a, a cadence, uh, and a, a bit of routine, it sounds like maybe it's kind of crazy or, or almost too disciplined. But what I found is if you can set that up and that's like 40% of your day, then the rest, the other 60%, it can be whatever the heck it needs to be. You got to put out a fire. You got to, you know, sky's falling that day. That's okay. Cause you, you'll have the capacity, the resource, you'll have the energy and the brain power to go focus on, on that because you've got the rest of this thing as this routine that's kind of moving you forward. I found that most people don't do that. They sleep in, they screw around, they come to work, they, they hang around. They, they don't think about running their lives like that. And what I found is I end up with more free time, more time with my family, um, more intimate time with my wife and my daughters and all that kind of stuff. And uh, it's because I don't have all that other garbage hanging over me. Um, so I think that's also kind of one of those secrets, you know, calendar blocking and developing good habits, I think is a key, key aspect in life. What would be your most important breakthrough in your business? Oh man, geez. You know, I think it's a personal one. You know, one of the things I struggled with was not understanding others well enough. Um, once I figured out that like not, no one else thinks like I do. And it, like an entrepreneur is a different, they think about the world differently. And that's a good thing because if the world is full of entrepreneurs, no, you know, we might, we, nothing to get done. <laughs> Yeah, everybody, be, everybody be all running around trying to sell each other and create stuff, but nobody actually do the work. And, uh, and it was kind of funny. I think of I, my brain lives in the future. And sometimes that that's overwhelming for people. My wife's the complete opposite. She, you know, she, she is a very task oriented, deliberate person and I'm not. Um, and so it's actually, it wasn't until I really realized that, um, I, I, I if I understood people a little better, they really, they want the same thing I do, but the way they're going to do it is going to be the, the opposite. We're just going to, we're going to take opposite paths, but we're going to end up at the same spot. And once I figured that out um, and kind of learned about myself that way, it really changed my life. And I realized that those people that were driving me crazy um, because they didn't see what I saw or they didn't want to take the risk I could take. And, and you know, I felt like they were holding me back in some ways, or I, I, there was something wrong where I couldn't, I couldn't get them to see what I saw or, or do what I wanted them to do. And it wasn't until I figured out that they just saw the world different. And, it, what, it, and if I wanted to get them motivated, I had to see the world like they saw it, satisfy them first, the need, like they, they might not be, a, you know, they're risk averse. You know, I, I have no risk aversion. <laughs> They're risk averse. And so a risk averse person needs to see what was done in the past, why it worked so that they have confidence in themselves to move forward. And so I think once I realized that about myself, my income doubled, my personal wealth, you know, quadrupled, um, you know, it was like one of those moments in life that I think uh, really was changing. And it was funny because it was started like that the catalyst that started this thought process it wasn't like I read a book or something. I actually had somebody that I was frustrated with. And I met a, a guy that is like a, like a, uh, one of these organizational consultants or whatever. And instead of focusing on the person that I wanted to, to hire him to fix, he turned around and pointed at me. He started asking me like, well, how are you? How do you act like this? How does that make you feel? You know? And it was, and I'm like, well, wait a minute, you're, I'm hiring you to go fix the dude over there. Not me. I'm good. And it, it, he, he sort of was like, he had me ask myself this question, you know, um, you know, what do I expect to have happen? You know, and it was kind of an interesting thing. It's like, and, and how would that make me feel? And what am I doing in order to encourage that person to take that beat, that type of behavior? And he turned it all around on me and he really, he made me realize that the, the, it wasn't, it wasn't me versus them. It's me versus me. Um, so that's probably the biggest thing, I guess, long answer, but, but you know, 
that's the biggest thing. Just your own personal being willing to grow personally, I think uh, unlocks a lot of doors. I think, you know, for us, uh, we would love, you know, we're always on the hunt for pioneers, people that are really looking to do great things with their lives and with their careers. We're looking for people that are technologists, which means you're You've got some experience developing software, thinking about software, thinking about how to solve hard problems. And we really are building an amazing company here in Kansas City. We've got people all over the United States today. And they're badass people with gumption and they're, they really see an opportunity uh, to change the world by making data easier to use. But they're also pioneers, right? They, they're people that don't, that see the world a little differently. And if you're that kind of person, we'd love to talk to you and, and, and love to introduce you to uh, our company. In fact, uh, we've just won uh, Forbes magazine, just named us one of the best startup employers to work for in the entire world. Uh, and we're really proud of that. And, and uh, so if there's any of this resonates with you, uh, I, I worry for you a little <laughs> if it does, but we would love to talk to you uh, and, and meet you and learn more about you and see if there's a good fit. 21st Century Entrepreneurship with Martin Piskarik.